Well, a very warm welcome to you. My name is Mark and I'm one of the leaders here at Christ Central Church in Fredericton. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to connect with you online, whether you're here in New Brunswick or whether you are further afield. If you are local to us uh, and want to find out more about our church and the things that we do, maybe some of our online Zoom groups, then please do get in touch with us uh, and uh, through our website or our social media feeds, we'd love to help you some more. Well, I wonder how we're doing right now. We're around a month into the physical distancing measures which have been put in place, uh, certainly here in uh, New Brunswick. I wonder how we're feeling. I wonder how much joy and happiness we feel we have in our lives right now. It's a huge question because joy and happiness is something that we're all searching for. Every single one of us is the main driving force in our lives. The truth is that deep down, most of us aren't happy. Um, they don't feel happy enough anyway. Most of the time in our lives, we divert ourselves from those feelings of dissatisfaction, uh, our unhappiness. We just do something else to take our minds off it. But in these days of COVID-19, there are fewer and fewer things for us to do to take our mind off it. And we're more and more fearful of the things that we do have being taken away from us. Our health, our friends, our families, even our life. Peace and joy and happiness can seem far away. Fear and unhappiness can so easily crowd in. And many of us have tried to find joy and happiness in possessions. We think we just need one more thing and then we'll be content, whether it's the next new outfit or the next car or the next vacation, a bit more money. But we're actually finding that we can't even do those things right now. And even when we could, we always felt that we were still wanting more. Or maybe we feel we'll be happy when we find a partner or when we have kids or when we get that great job. But soon we can get disappointed and disillusioned when the day-to-day -day reality hits. When those little habits that used to endear us to our partner begin to annoy us like crazy. When the kids are crying and fighting endlessly. And when our job just gets boring or our boss causes us stress. Maybe we feel that fame and popularity will bring us joy and happiness, but increasingly we're seeing that's not the case, especially when we see others who seem to have it all and yet their lives end tragically, often at their own hands. We shouldn't be surprised. There was a guy in the Bible called Solomon uh, who had it all. He had all that. And at the end of his life, he sat down and he wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes and said, it was all meaningless. It was like chasing after the wind. He still hadn't found peace and satisfaction and real joy in his heart. We're all still searching for joy. These days we're told that we have to free ourselves from the constraints and expectations of others in society to truly be ourselves. But that's just leading to a lot of lost and lonely and unhappy people. And we're already beginning to see all that in society. Increasingly, we're being told that we'll maybe find joy and contentment in spirituality, in meditation or mindfulness in the new age. Right in the mix is so-called Christian thinking as well in all of that, telling us we can find some of these things in God. We can find riches in God. We can find our health in God, physical riches, physical health. And, and that's what will bring us happiness. As an aside, it's important to understand that not everything that we read in Christian bookstore is a Christian, uh, is actually Christian. And not everything we see or hear on TV, radio, internet, which claims to be Christian, actually is Christian. None of this is going to help us. The good news is that we have God's word, which helps us to know where we can find joy and happiness. And we'll soon see that it's not in the regular places that people look. I mean, if we start reading the Gospels, we don't have to take too long as we're looking at the person of Jesus to see that that wasn't the case. Jesus was often described as being full of joy. However, he spoke about the joy that he had, that he wanted his followers to have as well. Yet Jesus was born into a poor family. He didn't have a high powered job. He spent three years homeless, hungry and broke. He had strained relationships with his family. 
His friends betrayed him. Some of them disowned him. He suffered his physical pain, false accusations, stress at life's situations. And yet he was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul was similar. Over the next few weeks and months, we're going to get into a series on Philippians, a book of the Bible which talks about the subject of joy and rejoicing more than any New Testament letter. So where was Paul when he wrote this book? Was he relaxing on a Mediterranean beach? Was he experiencing the cultural delights of international travel? Or was he reveling in his newfound fame as a world-renowned preacher? No. He was writing this letter from prison, probably in Rome, alone and wondering whether his life was coming to an end. And yet he's writing this letter which is so full of joy and hope. Some of us listening today might feel like we're in a kind of prison, perhaps not the kind of prison that Paul was in, but I know folk from around the world have been listening to these messages online and in some countries right now, there isn't even the ability to step out of your house right now. It's a very difficult time for many people as they're shut away from friends and family members who might be sick or even dying. But I hope that as we look at what Paul's letter to the Philippians has to say about joy and rejoicing and the good news of Jesus Christ, we'll be able to get a fresh perspective on life, joy and peace. So let's get into this book of the Bible and see what it says to us over the coming weeks. As I've said, it's a letter which the Apostle Paul wrote, the guy who was also known as Saul. He was the one who used to go around murdering Christians before he encountered the risen Lord Jesus for himself on the road to Damascus. And he wrote this letter with his right hand man, Timothy. He was probably the guy that wrote down the letters uh, as Paul was speaking. And, as he, and he wrote it to the church in a place called Philippi in Greece, a, le a church which he'd started up on one of his journeys. You can read all about it in Acts and chapter 16. He had some real adventures involved in demonized slave girls being thrown in, uh, demonized slave girls being thrown into prison, God sending an earthquake so that he could walk free and a prison guard coming to faith. It's a great story to read just how the church was founded in Philippi. Philippi was a place which ended up being close to Paul's heart and a place that he visited again after, as well as writing letters to that. So here's the letter that we have which he wrote to the church in Philippi and we're not going to get very far today as we read into this, just the first two verses and let's read them. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now this is obviously just the introduction to the letter that Paul's writing to the Philippians. And it's the part of the letter that we might very easily just skip over. The part that's saying who it's from and who it's to, a few general greetings. We don't get many letters written to us these days, I guess. Um, but if we do, um, we check, first of all, to make sure that it's written to us at the start. And then we skip to the end to see who it's from. In Paul's culture, they used to say who the letter was from at the start of the letter. I, I guess it makes sense, really, so you don't have to go to the back. So the start of a letter was pretty standard uh, in Paul's day with some general greetings involved as well. Not much by way of content. But that's not the case with Paul's letters. Paul had an amazing ability to sum up some of his major themes in his letters in just the first few words. And the book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippians, is just one of those examples. First of all, we see who the letter is from. And that we notice that he describes himself and Timothy as servants of Christ Jesus. The word servants is actually the word uh, the same word that is used for slaves. And then we see who the letter is addressed to. To all the saints, or some translations say to all the holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Well, that gets our attention to start off with. First of all, 
Paul is describing himself as a servant or a slave. What a strange word to use. Surely this is the great Apostle Paul writing the letter. Surely Paul is described as Saint Paul these days. But he doesn't describe himself as an apostle or a saint here. In fact, he describes the people that he's writing the letter to as saints. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi or to all the holy people. The word the Greek word hagios actually means the same thing. Saints, holy people. There's a connection between the two. But why is he doing that? Why is he describing himself as a servant or a slave and the people he's writing to as the saints? Well, we need to understand what being a saint means because there are people who use the word in other ways today which can easily confuse us. For example, if you're a Catholic, there are several steps that you have to go to to be acknowledged as a saint. First of all, you have to be dead. Then you have to have been found to have done some good deeds in your life, some really good deeds. And then you've got to have done some miracles. But miracles not before you're dead, miracles that you've done after you're dead. That can be quite a tricky one. And after all of that, then the Pope can declare that you are a saint. But that's not what the Bible describes as being a saint. Sometimes people describe as saints as just being good people. Oh, they're a real saint. She's a real saint. Is that what it means? Well, there's a connection there. There's a connection between uh, holiness and sainthood. I can kind of see that. But what does the Bible actually say that you have to do to become a saint? Well, it's pretty simple in the Bible. You have to be in Christ. That's it. You have to be a Christian. Saints are those who are in Christ Jesus. But what happens when we're in Christ Jesus? What is it that that means? Well, when we're in Christ Jesus, we're brought into a living relationship with the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus. Here are some of the things that we'll discover as we go through this letter to the Philippians. We'll discover that in Christ we're secure and that we have everything that we need. We'll discover that we have the peace of God. Chapter 4 verse 7 says, The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We'll discover that we have his glorious riches to meet our needs. Chapter 4 19, Paul says, Christ will meet your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We'll discover that in Christ we have a new way of looking at things. Chapter 2 verse 5, Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We start to think about things the way that Jesus thought about things, have the same attitude as him. We discover that in Christ we have new incentives, new motivations to live life in a different way. Again, at the start of chapter 2, Paul says, if you've got any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then live the same way that Jesus did, copy his example. And we might think, well, how can we do all of this? Well, Paul says in chapter 4 and verse 13 that we've got new abilities to live in this way. He says, I can do everything through him, through Christ who gives me strength. Paul's explaining, right at the start of this letter in, in verse 13, he actually says his imprisonment in Rome is in Christ. He says it's an imprisonment in Christ. And he says actually it's this that's helping the Roman believers to see they can get some new confidence in Christ. And when they see this, and they, they can tell people about Jesus with increased boldness and confidence. Paul being is in prison isn't a negative thing because he's not really focusing on being in prison he's focusing on being in Christ and that's what other believers are seeing and they're encouraged by that so this is where we find our joy in life we find our joy in life by being in Christ everything we need to deal with our past to sustain us in the present to look forward to our future eternal welfare it's all been stored up by the action of God in Christ and it's for us to share and to enjoy when we're in Christ 
For the first time, we're free. We're free from the penalty and bondage of sin. We're truly human, for Christ is truly man, and we're in him. Our human nature lines up with what God's intention for our lives always was, as a coming together. So it's not about what you've done in your life. It's about what Jesus has done for you. He died for you and he rose again for you. He's forgiven you and he's taken your old life away. He's given you new life. He's made you holy in his sight. It's a free gift of grace. You're now set apart for a new life. You're a saint if you're in Christ. Everyone who's been forgiven and lives in him is a saint and we're in him. You see, that's what Paul says in his letter, right in the introduction. He doesn't start out his letter and say, to all God's people in Philippi. He says, to all God's saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. You see, where we are physically comes second. What comes first is that we're in Christ. And that's what unites us together. That's what brings us joy and peace. You see, you might like to describe yourself and see your identity as being linked to the place that you come from. You might say, well, I'm a Fredericktonian. I'm from New Brunswick. And many of us who come from different places, were born in different places, might see ourselves differently. I might say, I'm from Yorkshire in England. Or someone might say, I'm from Zambia, or I'm from Mexico, I'm a Mexican. Many of us secretly think that the place that we're from is the best place to be from. We kind of get proud of it, we're, even if we don't say so to other people. But when we're a Christian, our defining identity, who we are, what defines us, is not where we come from, it's not other things, it's not our sexuality, it's not our occupation, it's who we are in Christ. That's our defining identity. So where we're living or where we're born comes somewhere after that. So Paul says, to the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. He might be saying to us today if he was writing, to the saints in Christ Jesus at Fredericton. Some of us were born here, some of us weren't. doesn't matter. What matters is that we're all in Christ Jesus. And notice that as Paul's writing, he writes to the whole church. He's not just writing to the leaders. He's not just writing to the saints who are leading the church in Philippi. He's writing to all God's people at Philippi, everyone together with the overseers and the deacons. That's those who would be involved in leadership of the church. We're all included. Paul's not just focusing in on a few people. He's focusing in on everyone. Now, of course, Paul is a saint too. He's in Christ along with those that he's writing to. So why does he say that he's a servant? Well, later on in his letter, Paul's going to be explaining that once we're saints, we're led by Christ to act as servants. As we come to understand and know who we are, we then begin to use that for the sake of others, not for ourselves. So Paul first had to understand that he was a saint and then he used that knowledge to embrace his calling as a servant of Christ. In chapter five, uh, in chapter two, sorry, in verse five of this letter, he's going to go on and say, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Paul's highlighting the example of Jesus. Jesus knew he was God. He was in very nature God, but he didn't use that to his own advantage. He didn't just think, well, now I can do whatever I want for myself. Actually, he made himself nothing. He be took on the nature of a servant. And he began to serve us. Paul himself could have boasted about the things that he's done. 
in starting churches all around the known world in preaching the gospel but soon in this letter he's going to be talking about himself and how he had lots of reasons to be boastful and confident in himself he could have talked about his education he could have talked about the things that he'd done he could have talked about what made him a, a an exemplary exemplary uh, jew um he could have talked about how he was also a roman citizen but he didn't talk about any of those things he lists them all and he says uh, in chapter 3 verse 5 he said whatever were gains to me i now consider loss for the sake of christ what's more I consider everything a loss. Everything, Paul. Everything. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus for my Lord, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That was the most important thing for Paul. It wasn't the things that he'd done, it wasn't his achievements, it wasn't the things that he had, it wasn't all the privilege a, that he might have had. They're all useless, they're all garbage compared to what he's discovered about being in Christ Jesus. For Paul that's the central thing and that's where Paul finds his joy. That's why he can write this letter sitting in a prison cell and it's still be full of joy because Nothing can separate him from being in Christ Jesus. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. It's not about what we achieve for ourselves. It's about what he's achieved for us. And being in Christ, it's not just about relaxation, a life of entertainment. It's about giving ourselves for others in the way that Jesus gave himself for us. Because the saint is also a servant of Christ Jesus just as Paul had discovered that. So how can we live that out? Only through the gift of God. Paul prays in verse two, he says, grace and peace to you from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. Grace, grace is God giving everything that we need. He gives us everything that we need, but don't deserve. He gives us love and forgiveness and mercy. We don't deserve any of that. We can't do anything about it ourselves. We can't earn it. God gives it us. It's completely free. And peace. He gives us peace. We can know peace with God, but we can also know an inner peace as we are being made whole. And we can have peace through the harmony and Christian relationships that we have. God breaks down dividing walls that we have between him and us and between us and each other. The things which would have been causes of conflict suddenly are dealt with and we can have peace with each other. And this peace can keep us joyful and confident even in the midst of turmoil that might be going in on in our life. So, as we start into this wonderful, joyful letter which Paul wrote in a cold, prison cell let's begin by understanding exactly who we are in Christ we're saints we're holy we're righteous made right with God we're forgiven we're free we're empowered and then let's live out who we are who we've understood ourselves to be let's live it out for the sake of others following the example of Jesus, being saints, but being servants. And as we do that, we'll find joy and happiness, despite whatever circumstance we might be in. Uh, my prayer this morning is that you find that peace and joy and happiness. The only place you're going to find it is in Christ, but it's available for you pray that you find it in Jesus name. God bless you. Hope to see you again soon.